Hello, Suri sir. Am I audible, Suri sir? Uh, good morning, Mr. Piyush Chandra. Namaskar. Namaskar. Maybe we can check whether the speakers, uh, he can share the screen or not, right? Are you sharing the screen? Uh, yes, sir. That is already being checked. Okay. Yes, sir. So shall we start with the session now? Yes. Yeah, I think we can start now. Okay. Thank you, sir. So over sir. to you, Itolikar, sir. Warm welcome to all on uh, 87th Annual Conference of Indian Mathematical Society, yeah. an international meet. Uh, day second. Uh, so, uh, good morning to all uh, dignitaries, uh, chairperson Professor B. Suri sir, uh, and welcome to the 32nd Srinivasa Ramanujan Memorial Award Lecture. So, uh, Professor T. N. Venkatraman, TIFR, uh, Mumbai. Uh, I welcome. Uh, to the uh, chairperson of this uh, particular session, Professor B. Suri, sir, who is the professor at uh, ISI Bangalore Center. And uh, now I hand over this session to uh, B. Suri, sir. Very good. Good morning to everybody and uh, welcome to the second day of the conference. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure and privilege to introduce the First speaker of today, uh, Professor T. N. Venkat Ramana from TIFR Bombay, uh, now called Mumbai. So, Venkat Ramana graduated from Mysore University in 1979 and joined the Tata Institute as a research scholar. He got his PhD from uh, TIFR and Mumbai University in 1990 for his thesis work on arithmeticity of lattices in positive characteristic, written under the supervision of Professor M. S. Raghunathan. Uh, he is currently a senior professor at the School of Mathematics, TIFR. He was awarded, uh, he has won several awards, among other things. He awarded. He was awarded Young Scientist Award in 1990, Birla Award in 2000, 
द आईसीटी पी प्राइज इन टू थाउजेंड द शांति स्वरूप भटनागर प्राइज इन टू थाउजेंड वन ही इज ऑल्सो फेलो ऑफ द इंसा एंड इंडियन अकेडमी ऑफ साइंसेस अपार्ट फ्रॉम ऑल्सो बींग फेलो ऑफ द अमेरिकन मैथमेटिकल सोसाइटी ही वॉज एन इन्वाइटेड स्पीकर एट द आई सी एम इन हैदराबाद इन टू थाउजेंड टेन हिज रिसर्च इंटरेस्ट और इन द एरिया ऑफ आलिब्राइड ग्रुप्स एंड ऑटोमोफिक फॉर्म्स टूडे ही इज गोइंग टू स्पीक ऑन मोनोड्रोमी ऑफ हैपी जियोमेट्रिक फंक्शंस Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Venkatesh Ramana to deliver this Sinhwas Ramanujan Mem- Memorial Talk uh, Award Talk. Please, sir. go ahead. Hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, Suri. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, so, can I share the screen now? Yes, sir. You can share your hmm. screen, please. Yeah. So hmm. I just I want to make one uh, announcement. Sorry, but uh, yeah. uh, it's a norm that uh, uh, questions are not entertained during this award uh, plenary and uh, these award talks. <laughs> Any questions that you might have, you might later uh, communicate to the speaker. That's all. Please go ahead. Okay. okay. So uh, first of all, uh, the title of my talk is Monodromy and Arithmetic Groups. I will explain the uh, terms involved presently. first uh, my first uh, pleasure and duty is to thank the organizers i would like to thank them and also professor piyush chandra for uh, his invitation to take part in this very nice conference i also thank professor suri for the very nice introduction that he gave and uh, so the this question of monodromy and arithmetic groups is motivated by a question Uh, that was asked by peter sarnak many years ago so the question is the following it he defines what are called thin groups a subgroup of sl and z is said to be thin if it has infinite index in the integer points of its zariski closure now what is the zariski closure it is the smallest closed subset in the zariski topology on sl and that is if you have a collection of polynomials Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Your your Sorry. screen is not visible, sir. You have not uh-huh. shared the it screen. It is not uh, shared actually. Hmm. Right. I <laughs> said I. Yeah. It was. It was shared by you, but now it is not visible. Can you please How about now? Sir, uh, kindly share it again. Okay, I yeah, did. Just, uh, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> okay. Ah. Uh, How about now? Ah yes, sir. Ah yes, now yes, yes, yes. Now it's Thank you. So, uh, as I said, the title of my talk is Monodromy and Arithmetic Groups, and the motivation for this uh, particular thing comes from a definition of uh, Peter Sarnak, who asks, uh, you know, start with a subgroup of S L and Z, n by n matrices of determinant one with integer coefficients, and uh, you can consider the zariski closure of this subgroup the zariski closure is the set of zeros of all the polynomials in the matrix entries aij this if these polynomials should vanish on gamma they should also vanish on g so that g is then called the zariski closure so this given this zariski closure inter, you can intersect this zariski closure with the integer points that is called the integral zariski closure so if a subgroup has finite index in the integral zariski closure it's called an arithmetic group if a subgroup has infinite index in the integral zariski closure it's called a thin group so the problem with thin groups is that you can show lots of them exist but it's quite hard to prove that a given subgroup is thin or not that is the to decide whether it's thin or not in fact in this degree of generality it cannot be decided it's an undecidable problem so as i said before you start with a, a subgroup of sl and z if you use what's called a tits's ping pong construction you can produce lots of thin groups so these thin groups are free products of smaller groups so this kind of free products is easy to construct so you can produce plenty of thin groups but the problem is not to produce thin groups but whether but whether you can decide a given group is thin or not and in particular it's not very easy to produce the thin groups 
which are not free products so but there are uh, you know you must have natural subgroups of sl and z which you can produce and then ask whether they are thin or uh, not so a natural family of subgroups is what are called monodromy groups so they show up as follows so what you do you so you start with a morphism of algebraic varieties x over s it's a morphism that is uh, the map is also algebraic so you have a morphism of varieties which in the smooth category is a locally trivial vibration and the fibers are smooth projective varieties we will see plenty of examples so uh, let me just give you the general question so these are smooth projective varieties therefore for each uh, element in the base each point in the base the fiber is a smooth projective variety that's what it means to say you have a, a morphism of varieties with fibers smooth projective then you can look at the fundamental group of the base which is uh, based at this point let's say then it acts on the integral homology of the fiber but then you can take the integral cohomology of the fiber cohomology of the fiber go modulo torsion it is a free abelian group of rank let's say capital m so the since the fundamental group acts on the integral cohomology group it also acts on that free part z to the n so you get a homomorphism of the fundamental group into gl n z so the image of this representation is called the monodromy group of the vibration and that holds the key to many questions on the vibration itself so there was a uh, old conjecture of griffiths and schmidt which was made in the tata institute in the early 70s that in this context when you have a morphism of varieties with fiber smooth projective the monodromy group is always an arithmetic group in the sense that i described before that is the monodromy group has finite index in the group of integer points of the zariski closure but in fact uh, it is known that that is not always the case there are plenty of examples so before going on let me just give you an example of a morphism of varieties where the fibers are smooth projective so this is an example which you have seen Uh, before so uh, we look at the lagendre family of elliptic curves that is uh, you start with a curve uh, whose affine equation looks like this y square equals x into x minus 1 into x minus lambda so this is a non singular cubic so lambda had better not be 0 or 1 so lambda is a point on the projective line where you uh, get rid of the point 0 1 and infinity so for each of these uh, lambda you get a curve which is called an elliptic curve so you get the space of elliptic curves fibering over this base the base is c minus 0 1 so uh, the fundamental group is a free group on two generators the each the generator is being given by a small loop around the point 0 and a small loop around the point 1 so these two loops generate uh, the fundamental group so the fundamental group of s then operates on uh, the homology of the fiber which is just z2 so we get a representation of the free group on two generators into sl2z so you can ask what this representation is if you choose a nice basis uh, into the details of which i don't want to go so then the free group uh, one generator maps on to 1 2 0 1 the generator around 0 maps on to 1 0 2 1 so this is this is the image of the uh, generator around infinity this is the image of the generator around 0 now it, it is known that the these two matrices 1 2 0 1 and 1 0 2 1 generate a subgroup of finite index in sl to z 
in fact somewhat surprisingly this is proved in all forces book on complex analysis so uh, it has a long history so this group has finite index so the monodromy group here is an arithmetic group in fact it is the congruence of group of level 2 except for the element plus or minus 1 identity but if you tweak this example just a little bit already uh, you will see that the situation becomes complicated so in this particular instance you have the fibers which are smooth projective you have the base here and you have the monodromy representation we just now saw that the monodromy group has finite index in sl2z and therefore it's an arithmetic group but if you consider just a variant of this example there are complications so i start with uh, a point on that same base as before p1 minus 0 1 infinity so i will take a lambda which is neither 0 nor 1 nor infinity and it should also not be that c inverse where c is some fixed chosen point so for each such lambda we have two elliptic curves e lambda and d e of c lambda so i can take the product such a product of elliptic curves is what is called an abelian is all is an example of an abelian surface so you have a family of abelian surfaces fibering over p1 minus 0 1 infinity and all the c inverse so now the fundamental group of this object this base s minus c inverse is a free group on three generators one generator around 0 one generator around infinity and a generator around c inverse so there are three uh, loops so the fundamental group of this latter space is the free group on three generators so there is a well known example of madhav nori who proved that the monodromy representation of the free group on three generators on the first homology of this product it is zariski dense in sl2 cross sl2 but it has infinite index in sl2 z cross sl2 z so already the monodromy group is a thin group so in some sense uh, this was because the the zariski project is a product so in a product situation uh, the first uh, known examples of uh, monodromy which is not arithmetic which are thin was produced by delin and mostov in fact somewhat uh, interestingly when the, when griffiths and schmidt made this conjecture they did not know that the counter examples to that conjecture were provided about 100 years before by uh, schwartz h a schwartz uh, because schwartz phrased his uh, his result in terms of uh, hypergeometric differential equations and it was uh, delin and mostow who interpreted those results as saying that the monodromy of cyclic coverings of a projective line uh, can be thin groups so in anyhow so delin and mostow used the monodromy of cyclic coverings of families uh, families of cyclic coverings of p1 to exhibit what are called thin groups they also showed that some of these monodromy groups are non arithmetic lattices that is discrete subgroups with finite covolume in the group u21 and u31 <clears throat> so the periods of the cyclic coverings as the coverings vary in a family are instances of hypergeometric functions for example if you took the periods of this family you get special cases of gauss hypergeometric functions but these periods are also inverses to uh, to elliptic functions so the periods are inverses to elliptic functions and also uh, the periods in general of when you have cyclic coverings of p1 ramified exactly at three points like this 0 1 and lambda then the in general the periods are hypergeometric functions gauss hypergeometric functions
so the monodromy group uh, can also be defined as fundam- as a group acting on the so- space of solutions of a differential equation and those two monodromy groups are the same the monodromy that uh, we looked at before uh, in terms of vibrations is the same as the monodromy uh, of a differential equation so what are cyclic coverings of the projective line if you start with a projective line uh, and form a cyclic cover the cyclic covering looks like you have to take dth root of a polynomial so it looks like the cyclic covering is described by an equation y to the d equals this so we are looking at y as the dth root of this polynomial so that's a cyclic cover so we can assume that the ki's are uh, co prime and uh, for uh, reasons of uh, non singularity you have to assume that uh, the the numbers d k1 k2 kn plus 1 uh, have no co- uh, common factor otherwise there will be singularity so we want to avoid that so we fix complex numbers which are distinct a1 a2 an in the previous situation we had 0 1 and lambda which was not 0 or 1 so here again take n dis- n plus 1 distinct points in the complex plane so we can fix this numbers d the numbers k1 k2 kn but vary the complex numbers a1 a2 an plus 1 under the assumption that they are all distinct that's our base the base is the space of a1 a2 n plus 1 which are all distinct so to each point uh, in this base we can we get a curve so we get a family of projective curves varying on the base of points in c to the n plus 1 which are all distinct points so each of these curves let's call them x a k so they have the same genus you can call this g so the monodromy representation is now a homomorphism of the fundamental group into glg of z now each of these curves comes equipped with an action of z mod d order d so you can fix a primit- primitive d through omega of unity and you can send a generator t of z mod d to this automorphism y goes to omega times y so the monodromy action commutes with this action uh, you can easily show this so the monodromy group is therefore uh, shown to preserve a hermitian form on h1 of this the hermitian form is just the intersection form you take a, a one form wedge it with the complex conjugate of another one form that gives you a hermitian form but this class lies in h2 of the curve which is just one complex number because it's a one dimensional complex space and so uh, this f- can be interpreted as a hermitian form on h1 of this of this curve so furthermore the monodromy group not only does it preserve the hermitian form it also preserves the eigen spaces for the z mod d action so the monodromy preserves the part of h1 where the generator acts by a fixed scalar omega to the f for some f z mod d so the restriction of that intersection form to this part where this uh, generator of z mod d acts by a fixed scalar let's say it has signature pf and qf it's a hermitian form so it has some signature so you get a homomorphism of the fundamental group into u pf qf so the monodromy group goes into a product of u p f q f as f varies through z mod d so to explain the uh, result of delin and mostov uh, i would like to introduce some notation so you start with a real number and uh, write this bracket for its fractional part so for each i i'm going to define certain numbers mu i that is ki times f divided by d 
So let's recall what K and D are. You start with the curve of the form y to the d equals x minus a1 to the k1 dot 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 x minus a1 plus 1 to the kn plus 1. So the ki's are numbers here. D is also fixed. Ki's are fixed. Only the ai's are varying so as to give monodromy action. So I take the ki times f where f is the fixed scalar by which that Z mod D acts on the homology. So mu i is this number, k i f by D fractional part. So I'm going to write mu infinity for this number, 2 minus summation mu i, i from 1 to n plus 1. So the mu i, including mu infinity, satisfies certain conditions. I'm, this is an assumption. So this mu infinity lies strictly between 0 and 1. Later we will remove this assumption, but right now we will keep this. And if uh, i and j are two suffices such that mu i is not equal to mu j, then we demand that 1 minus mu i minus mu j inverse should be an integer. This is called the integrality condition or the Schwartz integrality condition. And if the suffices i and j are such that mu i equals mu j, then we don't demand that it be integral. We just demand that this inverse 1 minus mu i minus mu j inverse should be half an integer in case they are equal. So under these conditions, 0 less than mu infinity less than 1, if mu i not equal to mu j, then integrality is satisfied. If mu i equals mu j, semi-integrality is satisfied. So under these assumptions, so the group u, p, f, q, f, is just u n minus 1 comma 1. The signature is n minus 1 comma 1 because of this condition essentially. 0 less than mu infinity less than 1. What's more, the image of the monodromy group, in case the integrality conditions are satisfied, this image of the monodromy group has is a discrete subgroup with finite co-volume. The discreteness is the most difficult part. And the finite co-volume also, uh, also is uh, not so easy. Ah, then the uh, general statement is that what you get is a non-arithmetic lattice. Now, let me just uh, say why this is of uh, great relevance. Uh, normally, uh, given a discrete subgroup uh, in a semi-simple group, uh, such that the discrete subgroup has finite co-volume, you can ask in what ways can you produce this? In the group SL2R, there are lots of ways of producing this, such lattices. In case uh, you have SLNR n greater than or equal to 3, the only known way is what is called an arithmetic uh, method. And there is, there is a very famous theorem due to Margulis which says that arithmetic ones are the only lattices uh, possible in what are called higher rank, n greater than or equal to 3, SLNR. So the only groups where you can possibly find non-arithmetic lattices are groups UN1 and ON1. Those are the only groups. And so uh, Delin and Mostov actually produce non-arithmetic lattices in this case. In case this looks very general, but in fact, the only known cases where they produce non-arithmetic lattices are U21 and U31. U11 also, of course. So in particular, the monodromy group is not thin. So to this day, it is not known whether U41 or U51, uh, they contain non-arithmetic lattices. It's an open problem. So let, let me just give an example of delin master So we will take this equation, y to the 18 is x minus a1 into x minus a2 into x minus a3 into x minus a4. So all the integers ki are equal to 1. And the integer d is 18. So the monodromy as the distinct ai vary, uh, this acts on the first homology of such curves, these curves. So we can take the projection to the fth factor. L let me recall that there was a Z mod 
D, in this case, Z mod 18, acting on the first homology of these curves. So in, I take the part of the first homology where that uh, generator for Z mod 18 acts by omega to the 7, where omega is a primitive 18th root of unity. So it acts by omega to the 7. So if I take that particular projection, let's look at these numbers, mu i. Each one of these ki's is 1, and f is 7, so mu i is 7 by 18. k is 1, f is 7, d is 18, so mu i is 7 by 18. And so if I look at uh, whether the integrality conditions are satisfied, I take 1 minus 7 by 18 minus 7 by 18, which is 1 minus 14 by 18. I have to take its inverse, which is 9 upon 2. This is a half an integer. And mu infinity is 8 by 18. And I have to check this also, whether 1 minus mu infinity minus mu I inverse is also a half integer or an integer, and in fact, it is an integer. So by the Delian most of criterion, the projection to f factor is discrete and is a lattice, and the projection is not arithmetic. So this gives you an example of a thin group. It's a somewhat non-trivial example, but this is, if you take all the ki is equal to 1, this is in fact the only example, unfortunately. So, to come back to the delin master conditions, we had this condition 0 less than mu infinity less than 1. So, that is why we got this uh, rank 1 factor. But if you drop this assumption, we would like to know what happens. So, let us see uh, when mu infinity is greater than or equal to 0. So, that means mu infinity is 2 minus summation mu i. Let's recall the definition. So that means 2 is greater than or equal to summation mu i. Each of these mu i is the fractional part of k i f by d. So each of these is at least 1 by d. So fractional part of some integer divided by d is at least 1 by d. So this is greater than or equal to n plus 1 upon d. So if you look at this, this means that n is less than or equal to 2d minus 1. So if you have n greater than or equal to 2d, you don't have any rank 1 factors. So this delin most of situation is out. So again, you would like to ask what happens if the delin most of situation is out, what happens to the monodromy, whether that can be arithmetic or thin. So in fact, uh, you have the theorem. If you have d greater than or equal to 3, and n greater than or equal to d itself. And each ki, this is unfortunately uh, an assumption which I, I have to make. So if each ki is co-prime to d, then the monodromy group acting on these integer points of the curves is an arithmetic group. It's actually an arithmetic group. It's not thin. In a product of unitary groups. This unit, the product of unitary groups looks like product u, p, f, q, f. p, f and q, f I explained before. This is the signature of the Hermitian form restricted to the part of H1 on which the Z mod D group acts by omega to the F. So I mentioned in my abstract that this has something to do with the monodromy of Lauricella functions or hypergeometric functions. So I take fix this form, omega is dx by y. So for each one of these curves, so I have these curves, so I have y to the d equals this. So uh, let's recall that all the ais are distinct and they're varying in a family, s. I should have denoted it s, but I've called it f, sorry. So the homology of these curves is then what's called a local system over this family. And the periods of the form over these homology classes gives you multi-valued functions on the space F. They're not single-valued, they're multi-valued. You can see it already in the Legendre family case. So these multi-valued functions are what are called Lauricella functions, and their monodromy is the same as the monodromy of the homology of these families. So consequently, you can interpret the Delin-Mostow theorem 
as saying that the monodromy of these Lauricella functions gives you non-arithmetic lattices in SU21 and SU31. In fact, this is exactly how Dalin and Mas Dalin Master uh, formulate their result as saying that monodromy of these Lauricella functions are non-arithmetic lattices. So let me also recall for the sake of completeness what happens to d equal to 2. In the theorem that is stated, I said d greater than or equal to 3. Uh, when d equal to 2, the above theorem is true for all n and this result was old. And this is due to Acampo. You don't have unitary groups anymore. What you have is the symplectic group, actually. The monodromy group preserves a symplectic form, namely without the bar, the, the cup product. The cup product is a symplectic uh, two form on H1. The monodromy is therefore a subgroup of finite index in SP2GZ, where G is the genus of the hyperelliptic curve. These are called hyperelliptic curves. So in this case, Acampo uh, could prove that the monodromy is a subgroup of finite index here. It's exactly like what we had for uh, Legendre family. In fact, that Legendre family is a special case here where n equal to 2 and g equal to 1. Right. So uh, let me get back to this theorem, uh, how this is proved. Uh, is by first identifying the base, uh, fundamental group of the base with something fairly concrete. And we also identify the monodromy representation with a very concrete representation. And then uh, we can use some results which were known a long time before on the images, uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, subgroups of arithmetic groups generated by unipotent elements. And in this range, you have unipotent elements, and you can use those results to prove the arithmeticity of this monodromy. So this theorem is, uh, in some sense, a negative answer to uh, Peter Sarnak's question. Lots of monodromy groups are not thin. They are, in fact, arithmetic. So let me describe the proof in a simple case when all the ki's are one. So therefore, we are looking at this family, y to the d equals x minus a1 dot 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 x minus a n plus 1, as the very ai's are varying. So these ai's are not equal to aj if i not equal to j. We are therefore looking at the family of equations y to the d equals px, where p is a monic polynomial of degree n plus 1 with distinct roots. This is a monic polynomial with distinct roots. So the space of such polynomials, uh, unfortunately, my knowledge of uh, tech is not so good. It's, uh, you can draw pictures and show that the fundamental group uh, is associated with the braid group quite easily. Anyway, so it is, it is the braid group on n plus 1 generators. But the braid group has uh, very nice uh, generators and relations. It has n generators, bn plus 1, with the braiding relations. If the two suffices i and j are far apart, then the braiding generators SA, SJ commute. If they are contiguous, if i and j are very close, then you have the braiding relation SI, SJ, SI is SJ, SI, SJ. So you have this braid group. This has a representation into GLN or the ring of Laura polynomials in one variable. So this is called the Bureau representation, or rather the reduced Bureau representation. So to describe this, uh, let me just take a free module of rank n on this Laurent polynomial. This Q, we are going to specialize it to root of unity, omega to the f that I talked about before. So the braid group has a representation which uh, looks like this. So you start with this uh, free module of rank n with basis e1, e2, an, let's say. 
So the IS generator of the braid group acts on the jth uh, basis element as follows. Again, if J and I are far apart, then this SI acts trivially. If I take I equals J, SI acts by a scalar multiple. SI of EI is minus Q times EI. And if I and J are contiguous, SI of EI minus 1 is EI minus 1 plus Q times EI. SI of EI plus 1 is EI plus 1 plus EI. So it essentially looks like a 2 by uh, 3 by 3 matrix. The rest of it is identity. So it's called the reduced Bureau representation. And uh, as you can expect, this reduced Bureau representation is very closely connected to the monodromy representation. So let's look at the reduced Bureau representation. And now this ring, you know, I kept talking about a Hermitian form. Even the Hermitian form can be put in completely general form. You start with this ring, it has an involution, Q goes to Q inverse. I can call it Q bar if we like. For example, if Q is specialized to a point on the unit circle, Q inverse is indeed Q bar. So it has an involution induced by Q goes to Q inverse. With respect to this involution, we can define a skew Hermitian form, which is given like this. The uh, inner product of EI with EJ is Q minus Q inverse. The inner product of EI with EI plus 1 is 1 minus Q by Q. And if I and uh, J are not close, they are far apart, then EI and EJ are uh, orthogonal to each other. I forgot to state this. So it's easy to see that this BN plus 1 preserves this Q Hermitian form, and therefore the reduced Bureau representation maps the braid group into the unitary group for this Q Hermitian form. So you start with this uh, uh, general skew Hermitian form and the general action of the fundamental group, braid group, uh, on this R to the N. Now you specialize. When I look at R modulo 1 plus Q plus dot 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 Q to the D minus 1, I am looking at uh, this, which is the product of, you know, the roots of this polynomial are all D roots of unity. And that's what we want. We want to specialize to D roots of unity. Uh, that Z mod D action is, this is where it comes in. So this induces a homomorphism of algebraic groups or the unitary group that we had into unitary group where I specialize this to where Q is a dth root of unity. So we therefore get the composite homomorphism BN plus 1 into unitary group of this Hermitian form that is GLN of R modulo this. So this latter representation rho and D is called the reduced Bureau representation evaluated at all the non-trivial dth roots of unity. So if I have a fixed primitive dth root of unity and f is z mod dz, then I can specialize q to omega to the f. So I get a homomorphism bn plus 1 to this ring. Then this ring maps to uh, z omega to the f, that is the ring of integers in a suitable cyclotron extension. So the signature of this Hermitian form is PF comma QF, let us say. We therefore get a map of this rho n of d into bn plus 1, uh, of bn plus 1, that is the fundamental group of the space of monic polynomials with distinct roots into the product u, p, f, q, f. This latter is a product of unitary groups. So the monodromy group, uh, monodromy action of the braid group on n plus 1 letters on the homology of the default cover 
whose affine part is given by this equation is related to the reduced Burow representation at dth roots of unity. So the theorem is the following. If n plus 1 and d are co-prime, we need this, by the way. Then the monodromy action is isomorphic just to the Burow representation. In general, the monodromy action is a quotient of the reduced Burow representation. It's not uh, much if they are not co-prime. You have to go modulo certain trivial, uh, trivial subspaces. The trivial meaning where the action of the monodromy group is trivial. So, in particular, the arithmeticity of monodromy follows from the arithmeticity of the image of this Dura representation. So, the proof of this uh, arithmeticity of the image amounts to proving the following. Suppose I take d greater than or equal to 3 and n greater than or equal to 2d, then the image of the Bureau representation from bn plus 1 into the unitary group is an arithmetic subgroup of the latter unitary group. And in fact, therefore, this is the image has finite index in this range, n greater than or equal to 2d. So let me, once just to uh, fix the idea, let me recall how the Bureau representation was constructed. You start with Bn plus 1, and then you, uh, the, you have the representation into unitary group of this whole ring, uh, Z, Q, Q inverse. And then you specialize to all non-trivial roots of unity, so you get a map into unitary group over this ring Rd. But this Rd maps into various cyclotomic rings, Z omega to the D, and therefore you get a consequent homomorphism into this product. And this theorem says that these two representations are actually the same. So how to prove that uh, this image is an arithmetic group? The proof is by induction on n greater than or equal to 2d. And uh, it's a peculiar induction because you prove this directly whenever n greater than or equal to d is divisible by d. Then you prove this directly. Uh, then uh, you prove by induction on all the integers in between. So you first prove it for d, 2d, uh, uh, 2d, 3d, 4d, 5d, and so on. And then prove it by induction for uh, n in between these numbers. So for n equal to 2d, you check directly that the image uh, contains an arithmetic subgroup of the unipotent radical of a maximal parabolic subgroup of the unitary group. I don't want to say this because the terms involved are a bit technical, but uh, unipotent radical essentially uh, is an analog of saying if I take SL and R, these are uh, N cross and upper triangular matrices, strictly upper triangular matrices. And uh, maximal parabolic means that you have to look at uh, analogs of isotropy groups of SLN acting on the projective space. So those are analogs of maximal parabolic subgroups. So but uh, when D is strictly between uh, N and I, I stated the result for N greater than or equal to D, this case where D is between, uh, where N is between D and 2D, this is a little more involved. The proof is roughly the same for many Ds, but for some Ds you have to be careful. But uh, uh, luckily you can use the uh, part of delin mostow theory where they prove arithmeticity in the cases where they don't prove non-arithmeticity, they actually prove the lattices are arithmetic and we can use that part. And it somehow fits exactly into this uh, proof. So this is really the uh, new part of uh, uh, this case. It's a little bit complicated, so I don't want to explain the proof too much more, but one has to use uh, this delin mostow theory quite a bit in this case. 
So what is the result on the unipotent radicals of maximal parabolic subgroups that I'm using? The result is the following. So I start with a linear algebra group defined over a number field K and denote by O sub K the ring of integers in K. So I suppose G is such that the uh, infinity rank by which I mean the K rank of G is at least two. This is what is called higher rank. So we are not in the situation of the Lin Moster where they took rank one groups. And K rank greater than or equal to one. This is when uh, you get unipotent elements. So just to give an example, suppose I take S G equal to SLN and uh, K to be Q, then the infinity rank is actually N minus one. So if I want N minus one greater than or equal to two, I should take N greater than or equal to three. And in SLN case, K rank is indeed N minus two greater than or equal to one. N minus, yeah. N minus one, sorry, greater than or equal to two in fact. So suppose I have a subgroup of the integer group, which is Zariski dense, such that the intersection of gamma with the integer points U of OK has finite index in U of OK, where U is the unipotent radical of a maximal parabolic subgroup of G defined over K. Then gamma is an arithmetic group. Now this uh, result uh, is in this generality due to several people. The first result for what are called Chevalier groups, for example, SLN and SP2N was proved by Jacques Titz uh, long ago. And then uh, for uh, what are called classical groups, uh, it was it is due to Wasserstein. And in general, for uh, when the K rank is greater than or equal to two, uh, it was proved by M. S. Raghunathan. And when K rank is equal to two, uh, it's due to me, maybe to others also. And uh, so this was an old result proved in the early 90s. And uh, so this result keeps getting used in all these proofs of arithmeticity. <clears throat> at least in the non co compact case. Now, the problem with uh, proofs in the proofs of arithmeticity in the co compact case is that there are no more unipotent elements and there is no such theorem available. So, it's actually quite, uh, uh, quite complicated to prove arithmeticity in those cases. That is really the more difficult case that Dalin must have handled uh, by some geometric methods. So this is uh, we can, how we can use this for n equal to 2D uh, is to prove that the image of the uh, monodromy group uh, contains lots of unipotent elements. That is because of this fact. You take the group generated by Z comma BN, where BN is the braid group on uh, one generator less. And then you take the central element of the braid group on two generators less, Bn minus one. This commutator subgroup actually generates a subgroup of finite index in the unipotent radical of a parabolic subgroup. This is uh, by some sort of geometric method. And once you have this, uh, then this theorem takes over to prove uh, that the image of the monodromy group is arithmetic. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'm through. With this. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you, Professor Venkatramana, so for a wonderfully clear lecture. Actually, I know that uh, I just know recall people recall to people that uh, the norm is not to entertain questions. Um, for these kind of talks. Actually, I had a question in my mind which you answered uh, uh, towards the end. So okay. I don't need to ask. Any. I mean, actually, between two and D and 2D minus one, what do you do? And you actually answered. Yeah. Okay. Great. Very nice lecture. And uh, it's my uh, it's also my pleasure and privilege to hand over virtually the certificate uh, uh, to Professor Venkatramana for del delivering this 32nd Srinivas Ramadan Memorial Award uh, 
lecture there is a virtual certificate uh, may I ask thank you, you. thank you <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. I will, uh, yeah. So I can download it and virtually accept it. <laughs> the title is uh, slightly different from what you uh, yeah, actually uh, okay. talked about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Those so Loricella functions are uh, examples. This will be sent by post. Functions. Yes. Yes, it will be sent by post. Thank you, Professor Venkatramana. So over yeah, to the organizers. You, okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, T.N. Venkatramana, sir. And uh, thank you, uh, B. Suri, sir, uh, for uh, chairing uh, this session. Uh, the next sessions are the uh, parallel sessions, invited talks, and it will be start within uh, next five minutes. And, uh, and, and thanks very much, Suri. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Separate links are provided to join the invited talks. Thank you.